Hey guys, Ed with Red Horse Knife Works here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am a knife maker by trade. I've been doing it for seven years, and we just released our new product seen here, uh, disassembled, the BMF Cutter. I'm making this little video uh, to kind of explain some terminology and manufacturing processes that uh, warrant the cost of the BMF Cutter versus the other cutters in the industry. Uh, I know a lot of cigar fanatics aren't necessarily knife fanatics. Uh, so, again, this is more of an educational video um, on what makes the differences between the $5 gas station cutter, the popular branded, more expensive cutter, which ranges from about $50 to $350, to our cutter, which is $265. So, I want to explain to you... Um, why that cost $265 and why you're getting a better cutter with the BMF cutter. So, first thing I want to talk about is steel. Uh, obviously, that's the heart and soul of the cutter, and that's going to make all the difference in the world when you're cutting a cigar. Okay, now, on the $5 El Crapo free cutter, uh, this steel is probably, um, it's definitely stamped, and you can tell it's stamped because there's a rolled edge on one side, and a sharp jagged edge on the other side, if you can tell there. It's very thin steel as well. Um, makes it easier to stamp, uh, easier and cheaper. Okay. This steel from the manufacturer, they claim, is 440C steel. A great steel in 1995. Uh, but over the years, they've kind of developed better steels. Now, this steel is... Bowler M390, made in Germany. M390. Uh, this steel was specifically designed for the knife industry. Uh, it's very expensive steel. It's considered one of the most premium steels you could get in the market and has the best balance between corrosion resistance, edge retention, edge ability, and toughness. Okay, Those are the aspects that you have to look at when you're looking for a knife blade okay uh, so the other thing about steel is the heat treat the heat treat is very important on steel you could have fantastic steel fuck up the heat treat and it'll be worthless okay so we measure how hard a steel is and how successful the heat treat was by something called a rockwell hardness scale okay i have a rockwell hardness testing machine that is that doohickey there, and that measures how hard a blade is. Goes on a 100 point scale, so it's pretty easy to figure out. Now, when I tested El Cheapo, I got a 40 Rockwell, which I'm actually surprised it actually was that high. Uh, I was expecting low 20s, maybe 30s, because uh, that's typically where the 400 series stainless is. 40 Rockwell. Not bad, four or $5 cutter. On the $75 cutter, which is what I paid for this cutter, uh, they claimed, the factory claimed it was 57 Rockwell hardness. Now, right then and there, I'm not impressed. 57, if any of my knives left the shop at 57 Rockwell, uh, I'd be embarrassed. I would never release a knife from our shop at 57 Rockwell. It's just not hard enough. Our blades are 60 Rockwell. Now, I know what you guys are saying. Oh, it's only a, a you know, three-point difference on a 60-point scale. You know, what's the big deal? Three points is a lot when you're talking about uh, steel hardness, okay? That three points is the difference between lasting, ha holding an edge for three to six months to holding an edge for 10 years. It, it's a massive difference, uh, three, three points. Now, that is if this cutter was truly 57 Rockwell. Now, when I tested it, the highest I got after three tests was 53 Rockwell. That's, that's preposterous. That is unbelievably soft for um, a blade used uh, to cut material and for what you pay for this cutter. Uh, that, that is way below standard, um, and, and they keep advertising that it's uh, 57 Rockwell, which I, I wouldn't even be advertising that, but they do anyway. This was 53. That That is... Uh, Totally unacceptable. I would never let anything other than maybe an axe or some sort of tool that takes high impact uh, because you don't want that to be brittle. I would never let anything like that leave the shop at 53 Rockwell. Um, 
poor quality control on these. Uh, I tested 10 of these, and out of the 10, uh, there was less than a half point deviation. And that half point was only higher. So it went from 60 Rockwell to 60 and a half Rockwell. Uh, that is amazing accuracy um, for these blades. So the heat treat is very important. The next important thing about the scar cutters and how they're going to perform is the blade grind. Okay, If you look at the two blade grinds, our cutter has a much larger or longer blade grind. Now the reason why we do that is because the steeper the angle is from here to here, from the back of the bevel to the edge of the bevel, the more resistance it's going to put up against your cigar tip, and you're going to end up deforming your cigar. Okay, On a $40 cigar, you do not want that tip fucked up. I'd be pissed. Okay, Now, if you look at our cutter, the distance between the final edge and the very back of the bevel is much larger. That's because we use a much lower angle. And that puts less resistance and less pressure up against your expensive cigar. And that's also why we only need one blade. These multi-bladed cutters are just trying to compensate for crap design. That's it. It's just like the shaving razors that have like nine blades on them. It's because those blades are shit. If you get a good straight razor or a good safety razor, they all have one thing in common. They have one blade. And if you've ever shaved with a straight razor, or ever shaved with a safety razor, they cut much better because they use higher quality steel um, and a much better design. So that is why we only have and only need one blade. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is fit and finish and action because that is the next variant that determines how good your cigar cutter is going to work and also uh, justifies what you're paying for. So. This cutter was a huge disappointment. Uh, this was actually shipped to me with all the screws stripped out. All the heads of the screws were stripped out. I could not. I wanted to disassemble this knife for the video. Um, I could not. It, uh, every single one of them was stripped direct from the factory. Uh, and the most important part, which is the pivot right here, that's just a rivet, uh, probably an aluminum rivet. So I would have to drill that out and re-rivet it if I wanted to disassemble this knife or this cutter. Uh, very disappointing. Uh, for $75, you should have some sort of pivot mechanism that is much stronger than rivet because eventually over time, this rivet will loosen up with no way of you tighten it unless you peen it. Uh, very cheap, very quick way to have a center action. Now, if you look at the BMF cutter, we use a precision machined 416 stainless pivot. Now this also has a D channel milled into it. Very difficult to do on a small part. Let's see if I can get this bitch to focus. See that flat on there? That locks into a flat milled into the pivot hole. So every time you assemble, disassemble, reassemble this cutter, it locks in a place every single time and the, and the screw doesn't just sit in there and spin. So you could get everything tight and up to tolerance. If you look at my base, it's also shouldered. See that shoulder in there? Again, that's so these titanium body pieces line up in the exact same place every single time. It's the details that make the cutter. Okay, And the higher the details, the better this is going to function. Take these bearings, for example. These bearings are very expensive. When I put them on my knives, they cost me about seven bucks for a set of bearings. Okay, doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're talking about each individual piece, the price starts to add up. These are the highest quality ceramic bearings you could get. The bearings act as buffer or lubricant points between the metal parts. So you have that smooth gliding action and the ceramic detent, which holds the blade in, uh, snaps that blade close and holds it in there tight unless you want it to open up. These two cutters don't have any sort of uh, action buffer. They are literally just metal riding on metal, uh, which will eventually 
uh, mess up your tolerances. Okay, and that's why they need a spring in here uh, for the action is because there's so much friction, they need the spring to force the blades out. Sure, it looks cool when you open it up like a switchblade, uh, but in reality, it's a much inferior way to do things. Okay, with my cutter, you don't need that sort of thing. Our screws, which don't strip out, are also 416 stainless, very high quality stainless, and they're machined for us, for this cutter specifically. Uh, there's hardened washers in the bearing pockets, hardened steel washers. Uh, those are so uh, the hard ceramic doesn't wear a race inside the softer titanium. Okay, and that just adds a little bit longer years to your cutter's life. Okay, this cutter that I built, I wanted it to be an heirloom piece. Okay, so when you buy this cutter, you could get many, many years out of the use, as well as hand it down to your son so he could get many, many years of use. Okay, so when you're spending that money on a higher end cutter, you're buying that cutter for life. Uh, that is the difference between. Uh, something that's just an off-the-shelf versus something that I put my time and effort into designing uh, to the best of my ability as of right now. I'm not saying I won't come out with a better cutter. Uh, I'm just saying as of right now, this is the best cutter design that I could think of with all the details uh, thought about as much as possible. All right. So that's kind of the breakdown. Uh, if I forgot anything or didn't explain anything well enough, if you all had any questions, just email me, info at redhorseknifeworks.com. Uh, I could break down or explain anything else you guys have questions on. Thanks for watching, and uh, enjoy those cigars.